Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning comes to us from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians. I begin with the first verse, and I invite you again. Listen to the word of God. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. On July 30th, 1776, the British were making advances. They were preparing to drive Washington and his troops off of Long Island, and as they did so, they had a sort of macabre celebration where they took a figure, an effigy of General Washington, and they burned it for everyone to see in the camp. And alongside Washington, there was another figure, nearly as prominent in their minds and hearts that they burned as well. And it was the Reverend John Witherspoon. One of the English officers complained that Witherspoon, quote, had not less a share in the revolution than Washington himself. Witherspoon was close to Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. There are records of correspondence going back and forth between he and each of these. And in his most well-known sermon, he connected political and religious freedom. I guess no one had ever told Reverend Witherspoon how important it was to keep politics out of religion and vice versa. Now don't worry, I know better. In fact, my primary interest in Witherspoon today 
was in preparing for this particular Sunday as we are just a few days away from celebrating our nation's birth by way of the Declaration of Independence, I remembered that Witherspoon was the only member of the clergy to have signed off on the Declaration of Independence. And another fun fact that some of you already will know, Witherspoon was also a Presbyterian. On July 4th, we celebrate that declaration. And as I was reading through it again, well, I'll ask you this. How many of you have read through the Declaration of Independence in the last, I don't know, 10 years? Good. There's a handful. But for most of us, it becomes one of those things that we trust says the right things and still applies but we seldom go back and read and reread what it was that all of these were pledging allegiance to, staking their honor, staking their fortune, staking their families on this declaration. You see, Witherspoon not only signed off on the Declaration of Independence, he suffered the loss, the death of one of his children, a son, during the battle for independence. In that declaration, one of the things that we read that is familiar to all of us is that all men, all persons, are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and... <laughs> See, you remember it even if you haven't read it. And it tells us that that is the only reason for governments to exist, is in order to facilitate that those rights would not be impinged upon on one hand, and on the other hand, that they would enable and push that project forward. Now, after that, what you find in the Declaration is a long list of <coughs> abuses of power, calling out the tyranny, particularly of the English crown, of King George himself. And so it is that we have a Declaration of independence, which now, 200 plus years later, means for us many, many important things. It means fireworks, it means barbecue, it means patriotic songs and flags being waved, right? We love it. We love getting together and celebrating with family and with friends this declaration that we are no longer subject to any monarch. But today, since we're all friends here in this room, I want to challenge that declaration. I want to challenge that notion at its core that we as people who are called to follow Jesus together would celebrate independence. Instead, what I want to do is walk with Paul in a slightly different direction because in his letter to the Galatians, he pens a declaration of interdependence. He makes the case forcefully that in order to do this thing following Jesus, none of us can go it alone. And in fact, we will know if we are headed in the right direction by our relationships with and for one another. He says that we are called to freedom, but he says don't let that freedom serve as an occasion for the flesh. Now, when we hear that word flesh in the gospel or in the New Testament, so very often we begin to think about all those things that he lists out. I don't know if you noticed, but it's about three times as long the list of the bad stuff as it is of the good. But as he goes through and he talks about the flesh, essentially what he's saying is this. When we submit to the flesh, we are following that tendency that we have to do whatever we want and not to worry about how that is going to affect anyone else. Those who are close to us, our family and friends, or those that we don't even know. And what he presents instead is a radical way of understanding that we are always supposed to be subject one to another. One of the translations that I found that is a more literal translation puts it this way. It says, do not let freedom serve as an occasion for the flesh, rather slave for one another. 
by love. Slave here is a verb. Now, if any of you think about slave as a verb, you probably think about somebody slaving in the kitchen, right? It's the only place that I think of where we use slave as a verb. But we have a concept of what it means to be enslaved, a concept of what it means to be utterly subject to the will of another. And Paul says, that's right. In order to truly be free, you have to let go of being subject to yourself, to your own desires, to your own whims, to your own efforts to put yourself ahead of others, and instead, slave to one another. How do we do that? Well, Paul says we do it by love. And Paul quotes Jesus, who quotes Leviticus, in saying, the whole law may be summed up in this way. Love your neighbor. As yourself. Well, we all know that. We've all heard that. We've all said that. We've all memorized that. But the question remains, how? How do we love our neighbors as ourselves? Well, Paul says, in order to do that, you have to be guided by the Spirit. You have to be willing to submit yourself to the breath and the presence and the power of God. Now, many of you will know that I recently returned, along with 20 of our young people and four incredible leaders, uh, one of whom is present with us today. Preston, will you stand up? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Preston is one of those who is a child of this church who is currently serving at the Myers Park Presbyterian Church as an intern for their mission program, he took time off from that in order to go with us and to lead our kids in Jamaica. And along with Elizabeth Hargrove and um, who else am I thinking of? Elizabeth went, I went, and um, Lindsay, Lindsay McCaskey, who hopefully if you haven't met, you will. Um, we're all a part of this project. Now, when we went to Jamaica, it was really hard work. We were mixing concrete by shovel and hoe on the ground, and then we were scooping up concrete into buckets, and we were carrying buckets on a bucket line, usually up a hill and onto or over a wall, sometimes onto a roof, and it was work that was backbreaking. Um, it's more backbreaking now at 50 than it was 20 years ago. <laughs> when I went as a 30-year-old taking a group of kids on this same trip. This was the third time that I had been to Jamaica. The first time I went, it had nothing to do with any of the things that I'm preaching about except for the stuff in that first list. <laughs> Second time, my wife Sissy and I took a group of young people from Columbia, Tennessee on this same trip to the same camp with the same layout into the same neighborhoods with many of the same leaders who were there on the ground waiting for us. But something was very, very different about this trip. Not only in the composition of the group, but there was a wind that was howling and blowing every day that we were there. It was blowing so hard that where our group was situated at night, it actually blew the shutters open and awakened some of us in the middle of the night. Now, wind is wind is wind, right? Not always. You see, one of the things that we're having a conversation with as a session, the leadership of the church, and that many of you are being invited into in fits and starts, and eventually all of us will engage in, is a conversation about how that wind of God the Holy Spirit is the igniting and uniting and driving force to which we must not only pay attention, but must be willing to submit ourselves so that we won't be in a boat with oars or a motor on the back figuring out on our own where to go, but paying attention to the Holy Spirit and where the Spirit is leading us and taking and moving us forward. So for me, when I got to Jamaica, it felt like no accident whatsoever. 
that every day and every night there was this wind that was howling and reminding me of the spirit and the power, the breath and the presence of Almighty God. In Galatians, Paul writes that we are supposed to walk by the Spirit, we are supposed to be led by the Spirit, and as we are, that will enable us to participate with the Spirit in producing fruit. Raise your hand if you had at some point along the way to memorize the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before, even if you didn't memorize it. Okay. So this is not new news, the fruit of the Spirit, all of these things. In seminary, one of the things that you learn is perhaps that if you're going to preach a sermon, it ought to have, guess how many points? Three. But guess what else I've learned? Nobody has ever said, you know what, that sermon was too short. So I want to take just two points, two points out of that list. Out of that list of the fruit of the Spirit, there are two words that, as I explored and looked at different translations and even dug a little into the Greek, that I really felt like these are some things we can sink our teeth into and I hope carry with us outside of the walls today. So it's not love, it's not joy, it's not peace, but patience. That word patience is translated in one translation, magnanimity. Magnanimity. Somebody help me. Can y'all say that word? Magnanimity. Magnanimity. It sounds to me like something bigger and broader and more encompassing than patience. And some of you will know that if you grew up with the King James Version and you were reading about the fruit of the Spirit, the way it was described is long-suffering. And it's a really interesting word, long-suffering. Because if you move from the New Testament back into the Hebrew Bible, what you find is that there are a couple of places where it is used, but not to describe persons or humans, the creation, but instead the creator. It is used to describe God. It's a wonderful story about when Moses was meeting with God face to face. And the spirit, the wind of God, came to Moses. And as they interacted, there was a voice. And the voice said this. The Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Slow to anger is the same word that's used as long-suffering or as magnanimity or as patience. But the literal translation is this, a long nose. So you can carry that image with you, can't you? A long nose. But it's not Pinocchio. It's not a nose that is lengthened because of telling falsehoods. The idea is this. That the stuff inside of God is so powerful that if it is breathed out in anger onto the people, the people will be utterly destroyed. And so, where it says, slow to anger, what it actually says is that God has a long nose. That is, God's anger has time to cool off and to settle down before it is visited upon the people or upon creation. And you know what? We are a people who also need long noses. We are a people who need, when we rise up in anger because we have been offended or somebody has hurt us or somebody has brought to us something and our initial reaction, the reaction of the flesh is to strike back or to call out or to say something about someone else. Instead, to take a deep breath. Can you take a deep breath with me right now? And then breathe it out. And that's what Paul says we are supposed to do when we are spurred to anger. Instead, we are to be long-suffering. We are to take the time to breathe out slowly and in so doing, to allow the Spirit to create something different between us and whomever or whatever it is 
that has gotten us riled up and angry. So out of all that fruit of the Spirit, I want you to take that one with you, that idea of what it means to take a deep breath before you express yourself or before you act in anger, and instead to be long-suffering and patient with one another. The next one is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And gentleness is also described, again, back to the King James Version, as meekness. Raise your hand if you've ever thought, I just want to be more meek. <laughs> yeah, we, we read, the meek shall inherit the earth, and we all think, well, I'm not getting that then. <laughs> but gentleness, meekness, tolerance is another way that it is translated. Add to that list respect. You know, if you put yourself in someone else's shoes and begin to try to see and feel and act as if you were them, hmm, it sounds a lot like love thy neighbor as thyself, then hopefully you will begin to develop, again, that sense of respect, that sense of humility, that sense that I don't have all the answers. And my way is not always the best way. And in fact, if we're in this together, my way alone cannot be the best way. Before I came to Beaufort, a member of my former congregation who now lives up in Johns Island was fascinated by the Low Country and the Gullah culture. And he gave me a copy of the Gullah New Testament. You know, the International Bible Society has a translation. Some of you are nodding your heads. You have this. You've seen this. You've read this. Well, sometimes, not if all else fails, but if I'm looking for just something to shake me up a little bit, I'll get that book out, and I'll try to read in the Gullah. Now, if you have that or have seen that, you'll know that there's a problem. You have to read it out loud because it has to be spoken in order to be heard, in order to be translated. It's not something that you can simply just look at with your eyes. Now, I'm going to butcher this, okay? <laughs> but the translation in the Gullah says this, or something like it. God's spirit demek people so that they aim push, uh -oh, push one noad around. Let me try that. God's spirit makes people so that they aren't going to push anyone around. Friends, if we walk out and we get nothing else from today other than the Spirit of God says our role is not to coerce, not to manipulate, not to push people around, not to feel like just because we have the right answers we're going to impose them on someone else, but instead to practice humility, to be meek with one another, then we will have taken from this day exactly what we need. So. I said it was just two points. It felt like more, I'm sure. <laughs> Patience, long-suffering. When you are spurred to anger, stop yourself. Breathe a few times. Have that picture of the very God of creation breathing out slowly so as not to destroy with the fire and the passion and the power that comes forth. And with one another. Let us be patient. Let us practice humility. Let us recognize that my way or your way are not the way, but together, by the power of the Spirit, our way is the way to move forward. So, I hope today, and in the days that are before us, as we give celebration with one another to this day, this declaration of independence, that we will also remember that like the church in Galatia, Paul and I dare say the Lord Jesus Christ are calling us to a declaration of interdependence, led by the Spirit, practicing love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost.